As I told many of you guys, they are having the Lenten breakfasts now at uh, First Presbyterian, which is downtown. This past week, uh, Bob Hallman and I went over and we had breakfast and got to share the morning with those guys. Um, <clears throat> at the beginning of the service, the minister there said, okay, we're going to go around the table and everybody is going to give their name. You're going to say what church you're from, and you're going to say anything that God puts on your heart. So this one guy got up, and he gave his name, and then he said, did you guys hear about the religious mob? He gave up sweaters for Lent. <laughs> exactly. Now, of course, the funny part about that was, was Bob kind of nudged me and said, I didn't hear the joke. <laughs> And I thought, that's okay, I'm going to tell it again Sunday. <laughs> so it all works out just fine. <laughs> this morning, I'm going to teach you guys a little bit from Luke chapter 15. I'm going to use two of the parables that Jesus used to teach with uh, to his disciples and, and kind of break these down a little bit in insofar as uh, how we as the church are to look at the lost in our society. Uh, often uh, ministers will stand up and they will preach salvation week after week after week and they end up just preaching to the choir. Uh, you guys have experienced salvation. Now it's that next step in Christianity that we really want to grab a hold of for everyone. Uh, and that, to me, is seeking the lost. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10 say... Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety-nine and just persons which need no repentance." Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now, in these two parables, something of value is lost. Now, in the stories, the thing that's lost, whether it is a coin or a sheep, they both have monetary value. Nobody, including the religious leaders of the time who valued material things, would ignore such a loss. Rather, they would put every effort into finding it, and they would rejoice when they did. Now, if this is true about things, that are lost, shouldn't it also be true for people who are spiritually lost? The term lost refers to those who are not Christians, to those who are outside the household of God, but whom God desires to come home. You can see this in the story of the prodigal son, where the father says about the son who has repented and returned home, he was lost and is found. That's a little later in this chapter in verse 31. Clearly, it is those who are spiritually lost who are represented by the things in these stories. Shouldn't we respond to people who are lost the same way or even a greater way than we respond to things that are lost? Lost. Shouldn't we exhibit the same effort persever and perseverance in searching for them? Shouldn't we be filled with the joy of them being found? I believe that the point of this passage and these parables is primarily to remind Christians of how they should respond to the lost. You could also interpret these parables as primarily illustrating how God responds and searches for the lost. 
But even if that is the case, the message itself remains essentially the, st the same. Because if God responds a certain way, we are to respond a certain way to follow his example. Now today, I'm going to point out three things needed in order for us to reach the lost. The first thing needed for us to reach out to the lost in our community is compassion. Jesus had the tax collectors and the sinners gathering around him. These are lost people who are not running from Jesus, but rather running to him. They're not avoiding him. They're not ignoring him. They're not even hostile towards him. Verse 1 says they were gathering around to hear him. Now why? Why are sinners gathering around and so willing and eager to listen to Jesus? It's certainly because he wa it wasn't because he had an easy message. It wasn't because he tickled their ears. It wasn't because he compromised on what sin was or said everything they were doing was acceptable. They weren't gathering around Jesus because he's putting on some sensationalistic kind of show. At this point, in Luke's Gospels, the miracles are hardly even mentioned. What did the lost seek out Jesus, or why did the lost seek out Jesus rather than run from him? I believe the answer to that is his compassion. Jesus loved them and showed that love with a compassionate instead of a condemning attitude. I've got to jump in and tell this story really quickly. You guys know I'm putting together the crosswalk, so I'm talking to churches all over the county, all over the city, different preachers, different congregations, trying to get them to participate. So I talked to a guy in Conneaut the other day, and he said, I can't participate in your crosswalk. And I said, okay, why not? And he said, well, it's ecumenical. And I said, yes. And he said, there's going to be sinners and Catholics there. <laughs> I can't be part of that. People might see me walking with them. You see, he has separated people into different groups. He separated them into sinners, saints, and apparently Catholics. <laughs> when the truth is, we are all sinners. We're just forgiven or not forgiven yet. That's it. There's no sinners, there's no saints, and there's certainly not a separate group called Catholics. <laughs> We're all sinners. We have to have the ability to be together. If you think people are living in sin as a Christian, those are the people you should be talking to. But this guy wouldn't come walk with us because he was afraid to be seen with sinners and Catholics. I, I had to tell you guys that. The Bible says in verse 2 that Jesus welcomes sinners and he eats with them. One of the definitions for the Greek word translated as welcomes in this verse means received as a friend. This was Jesus' attitude toward those who were lost in sin. Jesus welcomed them. He was compassionate and accepting despite their sins and their faults. He was a friend and not a foe. Jesus had an attitude that lost people were attracted to. We have to ask ourselves, do we have that same attitude? As individuals, as a church, we're to reach out to people and show that we have that kind of love and that kind of acceptance. I use the illustration, when you see traffic accidents, and sometimes there are very severe injuries in those there are three groups of people that respond to these accidents, all with a different response to those that are involved in the accident. The first group is the bystanders, the onlookers. These are the people, they're curious. They want to see what happens. They have little active involvement in the accident itself. Now the second group, they are the police officers. Their response is to investigate the crime to assign blame, to write tickets, to look and see who's at fault, and to give lectures. They give out warnings, they give out punishment. The third group is the paramedics. Now they are usually the people most welcomed by those involved in the accident. They couldn't care less about who's at fault in the accident. They didn't engage in lecturing about bad driving habits. Their response is to help those that are hurt. They bandage wounds, they free people that are trapped, and they give words of encouragement. Three groups. One is uninvolved. One is assigning blame and assessing punishment. And one is helping the hurt. When it comes to reaching the lost, which group are we in? 
So many times in today's church, we will condemn people for their foolish behavior. We'll say, it's your own fault that you're a mess. You should have been in church like I told you. Everything would be fine. Or we're concentrating on helping those who are lost and hurting. I hope we're concentrating and showing compassion like this last group. Most of the church is responding like the police officer instead of the paramedics. The, this is what the Pharisees did and the teachers of the law. They were more interested in condemning and criticizing sinners than showing compassion to them. The same attitude is seen in our churches today, and we're rightly upset about the current state of morals, moral values, abortion, immoral entertainment in society, among other things. It's fine and appropriate to be concerned about these issues, but we must be careful that our concern about these issues does not turn into condemnation toward the lost. The lost have never flocked to hear this kind of condemnation message, and they're not going to start now if we have that same kind of an attitude. The second thing needed for reaching the lost is effort. Luke 15, 3 and 5 tell us <clears throat> about the effort that was put in to what was finding what was lost. I'll tell you guys a quick story. Uh, my grandmother had three daughters. She had two that were much, much older. And then they had the baby that was about 14 years difference between the older two girls. So one night, the older two girls, they're out with friends. They're 17, 18 years old. They're out with friends. They're enjoying being teenagers. They come home. It had been cold. They throw their coats on the couch, make a big, horrible mess. Good night, Mom. Then they go off to bed. Well, when they go off to bed, they realize that the baby is not in bed. So then they start to panic. Where did she get off to? So they start to search the whole house. They can't find the baby. They start to call neighbors. Now they're in a panic. The baby is missing. Where is she? They're looking everywhere trying to find her. They can't find her. None of the neighbors have seen her. None of the relatives have seen her. Now they're scared. They decide they better canvass the neighborhood. As they go to leave, they grab their coats off of the couch, and the baby's under them asleep. But the point is, they put great effort into finding her. They were diligently seeking for her because she was lost. In these two parables, Jesus emphasized the effort that went into finding the lost. In the parable of the sheep, Jesus said the shepherd would leave the 99 sheep in the open country and go after the lost sheep. In the parable of the coin, the woman lights a lamp. She sweeps the whole house and searches carefully for that lost coin. In both cases, the thing that was lost had to be sought after with great effort. The shepherd did not wait for the lost sheep to wander home, and the woman did not wait for that lost coin to just turn up. In our Christian lives and in the church, it sometimes seems that we do the opposite. We tend to wait for the lost to come to us. We're, rather, we're passive rather than active. We're waiting for people to come to Christ instead of putting effort into bringing them to Christ. I know I've been guilty of that. I've wanted people to be saved, but haven't went out and put in the necessary effort that it takes. And that's something that we all have to change if we're to reach the lost like Jesus did. We must put in the effort. The third thing needed to reach the lost is persistence. You'll see this in Luke 15, verses 4 and verse 8. In both these cases, Jesus notes specifically the person continued seeking after the lost item until he or she found it. In other words, Jesus is pointing out that persistence was needed to qualify or to get quality of success. After all, lost sheep among spacious fields and hills or the coin lost in the dirt floor of a Jewish home would not have been quick or easy to find. It's the same way with reaching the lost. It's not easy to reach lost people. People's hearts, uh, they, they don't want to receive Jesus. It's not usually the case where our first efforts meets with success. We have to try over and over again. Sometimes it takes years of persistence, but we can't be discouraged or give up. 
If a sheep or a coin is valuable enough to persistently search after, then people are as well. I'll read this illustration. This is from an article that I found, and it says, Following an exhilarating performance at New York's Carnegie Hall, celebrated uh, classical cellist Yo-Yo Ma went home, slept, awoke the next day exhausted and rushed. He called for a cab to take him to a hotel on the other side of Manhattan and placed his cello, handcrafted in Vienna in 1733 and valued at $2.5 million in the trunk of the taxi. When he reached his destination, he paid the driver but forgot to take the cello. After the cab had disappeared, Ma realized what he'd done. He began a desperate search for the missing ins instrument. Fortunately, he had the receipt with the cabbie's ID number. After searching all day, the taxi was located in a garage in Queens with the priceless cello still in the trunk. Ma's smile could not be contained as he spoke to reporters. And that's from the Chicago Tribune in October of 99. But here's the point. Yo-Yo Ma did not quit. He persisted because what was lost was too valuable to give up on. The spiritually lost are too valuable for us to quit reaching out to, even though our efforts don't pay off quickly. Now, I'll also point this out to you guys. The religious leaders of the day, they had become indifferent to the lost and even antagonistic toward them coming to Jesus. Jesus uses these two parables to illustrate how wrong their response was, especially com when compared to how they would have responded to recovering something of far less value. Jesus pointed out how joyful they would have been at the recovery of a lost sheep or a coin. Certainly, then they should have been joyous instead of angry about the lost coming to Jesus. Jesus then pointed out the one thing that matters most to God is the lost. They matter so much to God when they are when the lost are found, even one of them, all of heaven rejoices and throws a party. I love that scripture. There is more joy over one sinner coming to Jesus than over 99 people being right where they are. If lost people matter that much to God, shouldn't they matter this much to us? Shouldn't we be willing to give everything needed in order to reach the lost? My answer is yes, and I hope that your answer is as well. So what is needed to reach the lost? From this passage, we've discovered these three things. The first thing needed is compassion to reach the lost. The second thing we need to reach the lost is effort. And the third thing needed to reach the lost is persistence. Now, as I put this together, I decided to close with a letter that I had found. This is from a West Virginia farm kid who is enduring basic training on Paris Island, South Carolina in the Marines. It says, Dear Ma and Pa, I am well. Hope you are. Tell Brother Walt and Brother Elmer the Marine Corps work beats working for old man Minch by a mile. <laughs> Tell them to join up quick before all the places are filled. <laughs> I was restless at first because you get to stay in bed till nearly 6 a.m. But I'm getting so I like to sleep late. Tell Walt and Emmer all you do before breakfast is smooth your cot and shine some things. No hogs to slop, feed to pitch, mash to mix, wood to split, fire to lay, practically nothing. We got to shave, but it's not so bad. There's warm water. Breakfast is strong on trimmings like fruit, juice, cereal, eggs, bacon, etc., but it's kind of weak on chops, potatoes, ham, steak, fried eggplant pie, you know, other regular foods. But tell Walt and Elmer you can always sit by the two city boys that live on coffee. Their food, plus yours, helps you make it till noon when you get fed again. It's no wonder these city boys can't walk much. We go on route marches, which the platoon sergeant says are long walks to harden us. If he thinks so, it ain't my place to tell him different. A route march is about as far as it is to our mailbox at home. <laughs> then the 
the city guys get sore feet and we all ride back in trucks. <laughs> the sergeant is like a school teacher. He nags a lot. The captain is like the school board. Majors and colonels just ride around and frown. They don't bother you none. Uh, <clears throat> the next will kill Walt and Elmer with laughing. I keep getting medals for shooting. I don't know why. The bullseye is near big as a chipmunk's head. <laughs> it don't move, and it ain't shooting back at you like them Higgett boys at home. <laughs> all you got to do is lie there all comfortable and hit it. You don't even load your own cartridges. They come in boxes. <clears throat> then we have what they call hand-to-hand -hand combat. You get to wrestle with them city boys. I have to be real careful, though. They break real easy. <laughs> it ain't like fighting with that old bull at home. I'm about the, the best they got in this, except for that tub Jordan from over in Silver Lake. I only beat him once. He joined up the same time as me, but I'm 5'6", 130 pounds, and he's 6'8", near 300 pounds. <laughs> Be sure to tell Walt and Elmer to hurry and join before other fellers get into this setup and come stampeding in. And it's signed, your loving daughter, Alice. <laughs> and guys, I'm just going to close in the laughter with the idea. Don't let this weather get you down. Don't let what's going on in the cold get you down. Don't be afraid to laugh and enjoy your life. That's what it's about. Find something to laugh about every day, every week. That's what's important. I thank you guys for listening. <coughs>